This message is brought to you by DoNotAge.org, the longevity research organisation that's on a mission to extend health span for as many people as possible via products that actually work. Start your journey today at DoNotAge.org and use code LAMA for a 10% discount. That's L-L-A-M-A. I have some children in their mid-twenties, and I tell them to take good care of themselves because uh, you're all going to live to be over 100 years old. You're certainly not going to die of cancer or heart disease. Those problems will be solved in the next 20, 25 years. And so prepare for a very long life. Hello and welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. I'm Peter Bowes. This is where we explore the science and stories behind human longevity. Now, there is much we can do to stack the odds in favour of a long and healthy life. That's what we focus on during this podcast, the interventions that could help us to extend our health span, the years that we enjoy optimum health. But then there are times that it seems no matter what we do, that something comes along, a disease that stops us in our tracks, despite all of our well intentions and the healthy lifestyle that we try to follow. Well, today we're going to focus on what is clearly a sign of ageing for men, and that is changes in prostate health. And yes, it could be prostate cancer, the second most commonly occurring cancer in men, and according to the World Cancer Research Fund, the fourth most commonly occurring cancer overall. I'm joined by Dr. Mark Schultz, a prostate cancer specialist based in California here in Los Angeles. Dr. Schultz, it's good to see you. Welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Thank you very much, Peter. Do you work exclusively on prostate cancer? Yes, although uh, the there are spin-offs because we are also internists. And so when people come through the door with a low-key prostate cancer problem, Sometimes they have other looming problems that we'll address just because we're doctors as well as prostate cancer specialists. And just before we delve into that subject in some depth, let's talk about you and your career and how you got to this point. Have you Obviously, clearly as a doctor, you haven't always specialized, but just tell me where you went to school and uh, what made you become a doctor. I've always enjoyed human con- uh, relationships. I uh, One-on-one particularly, which you get to experience a lot in uh, physician-patient relationships, and so the uh, the choice to do medicine and then subsequently to specialize in internal medicine and then in oncology, which is cancer medicine, uh, and the natural evolution to sub, uh, subsequently subspecialize in prostate cancer, which is thankfully sort of a low-grade condition compared to most cancers, has allowed me to indulge that, that uh, fun desire to just get to know people and connect with people. And I mentioned by saying aging, a sign of aging for men, could well be changes in, in prostate health. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are unhealthy. It is just that a, a natural progression with time means that your prostate changes. Yeah, and there's a lot of confusion because sometimes our technology outdistances our common sense. There's so much new stuff coming out. And how do we interpret these these new tests that are revealing small little cancers that have been there for generations, but now for the first time we're seeing them. And the way they're going to behave is not always entirely understood at the get-go. And so some, there's been a history of overreaction to prostate cancers with a lot of unnecessary radical therapy that now in retrospect was very ill-advised. This whole issue of rapidly changing technology, and then of course the stakes are high. We're talking about human lives. We're talking about an area of men's life, uh, their sexuality, their their day-to-day uh, bodily functions. Uh, and so the stakes are very high, not only in terms of preserving life, but preserving quality of life. Now you say little cancers. Even just the word cancer strikes fear into many, many people. Are you saying that there can be forms of cancer that are not so dangerous and not potentially as, as scary as, as, as the, the word implies. Yes, I'm so glad we're addressing that, and that may be the most important thing we talk about today. It's subsequently been discovered that about half of the cancers that we term prostate cancers have about the same impact as a basal cell carcinoma of the skin, which is a type of cancer that doesn't metastasize. Now, it wasn't always known to be the case, and so the policies that were developed 25 years ago were to cut every one of them out with all kinds of woe and harm, uh, sadly. Uh, The industry is slowly backing off of that over-aggressive stance, uh, 
but unfortunately, they are still called cancers. And I have never figured out a way to diffuse the inordinate power of that word because it stands for the, the pancreas cancers, the lung cancers, the brain cancers, which can be fatal within months. Uh, whereas uh, if you look at statistics for prostate cancer, the five-year survival rates, all comers, is 99% for prostate. So let's go back to basics. The prostate, what is it for? Primarily to make the fluid that comes out when you have an orgasm. The, the, the semen uh, is produced in the prostate. It's really a carrier for the sperm. The sperm come from the testicles, but that's only a small component of the fluid. Most of it's a, a nutritional fluid for the sperm so that they'll survive long enough to, uh, to impregnate an egg. So does that mean that as men get older, they don't need a, a prostate necessarily to live a, a healthy life if that function isn't as important as it is for a younger man? Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, some forms of prostate cancer treatment uh, involve uh, the loss of prostate function. And men generally function pretty well, uh, even sexually, uh, assuming there aren't other issues of collateral damage, uh, with what we call dry orgasms. So uh, men still have a pleasurable experience with sexual contact, uh, but uh, aren't going to be getting anyone pregnant, obviously, and, uh, and, the, and the fluid won't be present. And I alert to this in the beginning that one of the first signs uh, to, to a man that things are changing, although they may not actually realize it themselves, but the fact that their prostate is getting larger. And that is a natural function of aging, isn't it? It is. It's, I wouldn't say it's – well, natural would imply that there's no negative repercussions. Sometimes bigger prostates uh, cause problems. Uh, sometimes they don't. Uh, so there's a lot of men – walking around with big prostates and have no idea that they have big prostates because they're not having any urinary symptoms. Uh, the development of urinary issues as we get older is common actually in women as well who don't have prostates. So uh, irritability of the bladder wall, um, the less distensibility of the, of the bladder itself, causing more frequent nighttime urination, all these sorts of things. So the prostate often will be blamed for everything related to urinary function. Uh, it's, all, you know, it's all blamed on a, quote, big prostate, but it, um, only a relatively small percentage of these symptoms are from big prostates, not to negate the fact that a big prostate is a problem in some people. In fact, it can be a huge problem for some people. Yes, it can. Uh, the, um, and there's a gigantic industry, probably bigger than the prostate. The prostate cancer industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. But the enlarged prostate and urinary issues are far larger from a financial point of view. So there's all kinds of surgical treatments, all kinds of medical treatments, uh, which uh, work with varying success. It's a complex and difficult area to navigate. And the PSA is another term that men will get used to hearing as they get older. Can you explain that to us and, and what the significance of it is? Yes. So PSA uh, was FDA approved in 1987, uh, an incredibly revolutionary uh, blood test because for the first time, prostate cancer could be detected at a curable stage on a consistent basis. It was like a miracle. The problem was is that uh, they, at the same time, discovered all these low-grade, quote, basal cell prostate cancers, thinking they were, uh, you know, malignant and dangerous and scary and led to an immense amount of surgery. So there's the good side and then the bad side of PSA. The good side is that if it's used judiciously and intelligently, that you can detect the, the more serious types of prostate cancer at an early curable stage, which is a gigantic advance over what we had prior to 1987. The vast majority of those men were coming into the doctor's offices with uh, bone pain, metastatic disease, PSA levels in the hundreds because the cancer had already spread, and completely asymptomatic. I always get a frustrated chuckle out of these online things of, you know, what are the symptoms of prostate cancer? And the answer is there aren't any, not until it spreads. So you don't start thinking about urinary problems. That's from maybe a big prostate. But uh, the elevation of PSA is a pretty reliable indicator uh, it, the, bad, the downside being it's nonspecific. It also detects these low-grade cancers that don't hurt you. It detects uh, enlarged prostates. It, there's another condition called prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate that can cause PSA to run high. So the downside of PSA is it's nonspecific. 
The upside is it can definitely reveal prostate cancer at an early and curable stage. And uh, so what does it stand for? And what's it an actual measurement of? Yeah. So prostate-specific antigen. So that's the acronym PSA. And uh, the PSA enzyme is what takes, and I, this is a little bit graphic. You can always cut this out if it's too, too, uh, too much. But uh, semen, when it's ejaculated, apparently for f- the f- physics of the whole process, is somewhat thick and creamy. But then after it has had a period of time exposed, it becomes very liquid. And PSA is the enzyme that cleaves all those connections and, and converts the, the thick, white, creamy con- constitution into a liquid form. And the reason that it's useful as a blood test is almost all PSA is kept very judiciously within the prostate. Very little is in the bloodstream. So if PSA is being detected in higher levels in the bloodstream, that suggests there's something going on with the prostate. Is it an inflamed prostate from prostatitis? Is it because there's a prostate cancer brewing? Is it because the prostate has become very large and more PSA is leaking out? And so it's... PSA in the bloodstream is proportionate to how much activity is going on in the prostate or with the prostate cancer. And so in terms of the numbers, and again, I know that men will, once they get their PSA result, they will fixate on that number and perhaps go online and try to do a search and figure out what it means. And an elevation doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong. Absolutely true. So you can have all kinds of benign reasons and even laboratory errors or a wild night of sex the night before can cause the PSA to run high. So when we have men that uh, consult us with high PSAs, you know, to some degree, uh, we first just repeat it and see if it's a consistent finding. But uh, subsequent to that, it gets complicated because historically the policy has been to jab a bunch of needles into the prostate through the rectum. And it's an unpleasant and a little bit dangerous procedure, uh, which thankfully now has been replaced by uh, new high-resolution MRI scans. Uh, But the industry is still charging along doing biopsies because that's the way it thinks. That's the way it makes money. And uh, But informed people start looking around for what we call a multi-parametric MRI. Here in Los Angeles, UCLA is doing the best MRIs right now. And men that have elevated PSAs, uh, in my opinion, would be sensible to go and get a scan with an MRI prior to the doing sticking any needles in the prostate. And, and in terms of the numbers, what to you is an elevated PSA? And we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. Yeah, that is also a moving target. So the typical numbers, if you just look at age, for example, for young men that are in their 40s and 50s, anything above two and a half. For men that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, anything that's above four, something in that range. Uh, the um, It depends on how nitpicky you want to be because if the f- next step is going to be a dozen uh, large bore needles in the rectum, you might want to move the number up a little bit. If the next step is an informed patient that knows he can go get an MRI with a non-invasive scan, then you might move the number down a little bit and say, I'll just be careful. I'll go ahead and get a scan. So there's, it depends on how people react to the number in terms of how hard you want to look. So the, the number of caveats that you've just included there probably account for the reason why in recent years there has been a sort of pulling back from too much focus on that PSA number. Yeah, sadly, the, it does require a lot of sophistication to extract full value out of PSA testing. And uh, our particular practice ex- focuses exclusively just on this area. And in my opinion, for me, it's still complex. I mean, I really have to think about how I want to manage each case. For the average urologist who's maybe 5% of his practice is prostate cancer and he's doing bladder resuspensions and major operations on kidneys and and, uh, a little prostate cancer in his spare time, there's a tendency to sort of default, well, PSA's up, let's just biopsy. Let's just make sure we're not missing any cancer. And that sounds very laudable, but the uh, 
uh, statistics indicate that 2% of the men that undergo these biopsies end up hospitalized with life-threatening infections, one out of 50 men. And uh, a million men are going through these uh, prostate biopsies every year in the United States. Big business. And a lot of them are necessary, in your view? Uh, yes, because if uh, a high-quality MRI scan is uh, completely clear, and if the PSA is not wildly out of, out of whack, then I think you're done. I don't think you need to uh, go through these uh, 12 core random biopsies. There's also some new, more sophisticated blood tests uh, and urine tests. One's called uh, OPCO 4K. Another urine test is called uh, Select MDX. And they are more specific for the type of prostate cancer that you'd want to know about. And they tend to overlook these basal cell low grade, we call them grade sixes, that really, they don't act like cancers. So you don't even want to know about them. So an element of, of caution is needed when interpreting results, PSA tests, uh, as you describe. But clearly, those tests can be the first signs of uh, a potential problem. It yes. could be the first signs of, of cancer. We'll talk about the, the what if I am diagnosed with cancer in a second. But I do like to focus, especially in this podcast, and I mentioned our goal is to extend health span and to, to live as long as we can and be healthy. So in terms of prostate health, is there anything we can do in terms of lifestyle, pure lifestyle interventions, whether it's dietary or, or exercise, to mitigate the potential problems or to extend the number of years when we are totally healthy in, in the prostate? Yeah, and uh, Peter, you and I don't know each other's backgrounds very much, and so I don't know what sort of stance you personally take on diet, but the uh, uh, when I came out of medical school training, I was sort of your typical doctor denigrating supplements and diets and things like that. Uh, and I, I can't tell you that I've become a whole lot more excited about supplements, but I have, through the, the PSA uh, grid, uh, discovered that diet is actually a very powerful anti-cancer maneuver in the prostate cancer world. This was shown to me by patients who uh, consulted me saying, I, I don't want any of your Western medicine. You know, they may be in a situation where their PSA was rising after a previous therapy like surgery or radiation, and, and you can watch PSA slowly advance as the cancer advances. So PSA is a good surrogate for what the heck's going on in the body with someone with prostate cancer. And lo and behold, these people would place themselves on these stringent macrobiotic diets, lose a lot of weight, which scared the heck out of everybody, but their PSAs would stop rising on a consistent basis. And subsequent studies, uh, there's a nice book by Colin Campbell called The China Study, which looked at the incidence of uh, all kinds of cancers based on how much animal protein we eat, uh, showing a very direct connection there. And so information like that, seeing with my own eyes, has convinced me that, uh, that a uh, vegetarian-esque type diet, and I don't adhere to some particular philosophy, uh, is impactful in a real way. It's not an easy thing in our Western lifestyle to implement, but for those people that want to get serious about it, I believe it makes a big difference. But you wouldn't go as far as to say cut out all meats. It's it's more a, a moderation that you would well, suggest? Well, I think, I think that the more two issues there. One is I wouldn't counsel someone had to do a radical lifestyle change for one of these basal cells of the prostate cancer, of the prostate. That's, that would be unfair. I'd be pretending that, that they had a life-threatening illness when they don't. But uh, on the other hand, it seems like it's a scalable thing. We do have some unfortunate people that have advanced prostate cancer and they're at risk of dying from it. And those patients, I would counsel them to cut down, get their animal protein intake down to less than 10% of their caloric intake. Mm. Uh, so, so depending on how extreme the situation is, would depend on how extreme a diet I would recommend. And I don't know whether this is no wives' tale, as they say, uh, tomatoes, tomatoes, those mm -hmm. kinds of foods are, are, are positive? So, in theory, lycopene is the active ingredient in the um, tomatoes, and apparently the lycopene is only released if it's cooked. It's locked up in the pectin. So marinara sauce is, uh, is the high in lycopene. Watermelon is good. Uh, the These antioxidants... Uh, got a lot of mainstream play uh, 10, 15 years ago. Back then, we didn't know much about prostate cancer, and we didn't have very many treatments. So there was an immense amount of energy that was put into looking like into soy powder, into selenium, uh, into vitamin E. And some multi-million dollar studies were done, and almost universally, everyone was a big dud. It didn't change outcomes with prostate cancer. So 
the um, I think that if you if a person is pursuing a more vegan lifestyle, he's getting all these antioxidants and whatnot. I suppose if you if you insist on being a meat and potatoes kind of guy, then maybe tossing a little bit of lycopene down every day will <laughs> cut your risk of a, hurly, a heart attack by five percent. You know, it's uh, it may help a little bit, but yeah. I think it's kind of. Uh, more of what you're doing on a regular, everyday basis, what you're eating, is going to be a big part of your destiny. Which can apply to so many other aspects of your health as well. Oh, as. it's just widespread. It seems that, uh, you know, as we've learned over the last 15, 20 years, and then someone shared a statistic that 90% of what we call modern medicine didn't exist 30 years ago. That's so, quite a stark statistic, isn't, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So, Ninety percent of what we call modern medicine didn't even exist thirty years ago. So, I think one thing we've learned, because the knowledge has expanded also in terms of diet and exercise, is that the impact of diet and exercise uh, probably rivals the impact of all that modern medicine can offer you. So, it's it's you know standing on both legs at the same time is going to maximize your your return in terms of your investment in trying to improve your what do you call it your health health span. Your health As span. opposed to your lifespan. Yeah, right. yeah. I think it's a really valuable phrase because yes. once you kind of get your head around what it means, and that is just living, enjoying optimum health mm-hmm. as opposed to a lifespan is as long as your heart is beating, essentially, mm-hmm. but you're not necessarily enjoying a, a great time. In I love it because it combines the idea of longevity and quality of life. But when you talk about either longevity or quality of life individually, it seems to exclude the others, as if you want to imply the other is less important, which is ridiculous. It's a it's a compilation. So yeah. I, I really it's the first time I'm hearing that. That's really cool. Oh, that's good. I, I like to think so. And you mentioned exercise as well. That that is crucially, and as m- we understand more about exercise, that that plays into this uh, alongside oh, the diet it, that you talk about. Equally uh, as much, or maybe even more than diet, it has, uh, it's not just prostate cancer, but all cancers. And then it expands, I'm sure you've probably shared with the audience many times, for the people that don't have cancer, you can show immense improvement in health span. I'll use that, tech, that, that term because the people feel dramatically superior when they're fit, but it's not just a feeling of, of well-being. It's translates into years of additional survival. That's an unequivocal fact. So the um, impact of a 60, 70-year-old that gets religion and starts exercising regularly, whereas they were previously sedentary, the improvement in their life expectancy is uh, matches that of a pack-a-day smoker quitting smoking. Which is pretty dramatic. Pretty dramatic. But, as I said at the start, what if, despite everything we can do, and clearly, and uh, I'm enthused by the fact that you uh, actually do share a lot of my views in in terms of diet and and exercise, in terms of its overall benefits for us, but we could still get cancer. We could still, for men, for men, could still end up with prostate cancer. But from what I've gleaned so far from what you've said, that certainly isn't a, a death sentence, and it is something, a disease that we could live with for a long time. Yeah, there are these basal cell types of cancer we talk about. We just watch them. And the reason that we don't treat them is because the prostate is located in such a sensitive area of the body that collateral damage, creating problems with erectile function or urinary function, is commonplace. Uh, In the old days where we thought all these cancers were imminently uh, deadly, we would uh, justify these mutilating operations uh, as necessary to save your life, and people embrace that willingly. Now that we know that these, um, uh, many of these cancers are harmless, we just watch them. Uh, but unfortunately, there are higher-grade types of prostate cancers, uh, maybe as many as half of the men that are being diagnosed every year. There's about 175,000 men diagnosed with prostate cancer in the United States every year. About half of them are going to need some treatment, and uh, that presents a challenge because the cancers aren't unusually dangerous. In fact, they're sort of unusually undangerous, but they're not harmless. And so to to die an early death from a preventable illness, is, is that's obviously not acceptable either. But to how much, how high a price are you willing to pay? Are you willing to become impotent to add, tack a couple more years on the end of your life, which is going to be, you know, let's say you're 70 years old and your life expectancy is 12 to 13 years. Uh, of course, no one knows how long they're going to live. But if you say, so I'm going to be impotent for the next 15 years and live three years longer, or I'm going to um, 
be myself and I'll live till I'm 82 and then I may encounter a problem with the cancer getting out of control. Uh, that's how slow cancer, prostate cancer can grow. And so you have to do these rough equations as to is, it, is the risk of immediate d- destruction of my quality of life through a treatment, even a well-intentioned and a professionally performed treatment, worth it for the possible improvement in longevity that uh, will happen 10, 15 years from now. And it's further complicated by this explosion of new technology. So maybe what we call incurable today or difficult to treat today in 2019, maybe 2025 or 2030, we're in this exponential rise of knowledge now. It's, uh, so that further complicates predicting who should we treat and who we should. Now, there's clearly extreme forms of prostate cancer where you'd be crazy to not treat it with aggressive, thorough, eradicating treatment. And with modern treatment, about half the men can come through that relatively unscathed. So that is possible. It's not a hopeless situation with these aggressive combination therapies that you'll certainly end up impotent or you'll definitely have urinary problems. That's not true. But there is an inescapable risk, and a percentage of men treated at flagship centers and going through the best possible treatment that will end up with permanent impotence as a result of their curative therapy. So, so these are the kind of things we try and balance out and um, educate our patients in terms of what's the cost of admission for your treatment, and uh, do you want to scale it down, scale it up? Are you more interested in preserving longevity? Are you more... Uh, interested in preserving quality of life, and these are the trade-offs. And all deeply personal decisions, and the, the, and I guess there is no absolute right decision. It dis- no, that depends is, that is on correct. the life that you're living. And that's that's so nice that you say that, and because uh, it just dawned on me that that is probably the biggest mistake that I see. Everyone assumes with such a serious problem as cancer that there is an absolute right decision. It would make sense that there would be. This is a common problem. And a lot of the um, industry portrays the choices in those terms. They portray the choices as, well, clearly, this is the best treatment because you have that. And that's never true in the prostate cancer world. There's always different ways of doing things, uh, different approaches and combinations. And the idea of simplifying it is attractive because everyone's scared and they want to know what to do. The caregivers don't want to waste time explaining stuff because that time is money. And so it's a matter of, well, I'm, I'm a surgeon. Do you want surgery or not? Or I'm a radiation doctor. Do you want You know, let's, let's make a decision here. You came to me. I, presumably you want radiation. Is too much pressure put on patients to make those decisions? I think that the cancer word puts pressure on everybody. Um, it's one of our jobs when people come see us is to try – and calm them down. People can't think straight. They're so nervous and frightened. And, uh, and you need to think straight at this point. Yeah. Otherwise, you will just be herded into some slot that may or may not fit your situation. And is perhaps part of the, the problem for some people the complexity of the system? And you mentioned the different courses of action and the pressure on people because I am a surgeon or a radiologist or, or whatever to take this course of action. And mm-hmm. people end up being men in this case will end up being extremely confused and, and actually may make the wrong decision. Absolutely. It's uh yeah, I, this is why it, you know what you're doing to try and and bring information to the general public. I think it's not just for prostate cancer, but all of medicine is becoming more complex by the year. The options are multiplying, which we say, well, isn't that wonderful? It is if you know how to understand it, access it, to to be able to search out the the good practitioners. Uh, but that is not easy to do. This is a moving target. What was great treatment last year may be second-hand tr- or second-tier treatment next year because things are changing that quickly. And I don't want to delve too deeply into this, but of course here in the United States, and we've got a global audience for this podcast, there are different health systems around the world, a free health system in, in the UK with the National Health Service, not the case here in the States. And the financial implications of the course of action equally put pressure on people, don't they? Yes, they do. The, um, in the United States, most people uh, that have insurance, and most, most people have some form of insurance, will get access to some form of treatment. But with prostate cancer, it's not only the treatment you pick, which, of course, that's important, whether you do a seed implant or an operation or some type of radiation, uh, but who does it? Because this is like brain surgery. It's a very complex, small target that they're trying to finesse 
And the uh, some people are just good at it, and others aren't. Now, if you're in uh, an HMO or you know you have Medi-Cal, which is the bottom tier uh, insurance here, you, there's going to be one guy, and that's or nobody. You're not going to have any choices in terms of trying to pick an artist. And uh, that will, could have lifelong implications in terms of the uh, quality of your outcome. So the many complexities aside, I think the overriding message of this is certainly constant checks and early detection is going to be beneficial for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, I would recommend, uh, you know, people ask me, well, if if I was living in Oklahoma and there was one urologist in the, in the you know, 300-mile radius who's seeing 90 patients a day, and he wants to do my PSA every year in case I get prostate cancer, I say, I don't know. The PSA might cause you more harm than good because you're going to get all of five minutes explanation if you do have, you know, you'll get a biopsy, you'll be told you have cancer, you'll be scheduled for an operation, whether you need one or not. <laughs> and, uh, and we know now in retrospect that many types of prostate cancer don't even need to be treated. So on the other hand, if you're here in Los Angeles and you've got your access to panoply of world experts that you can get second, third, fourth, and fifth opinions, and you stay educated and up to date on all your options, it'd be crazy not to do a PSA every year and to be, to be uh, sideswiped by a metastatic prostate cancer that could have been completely prevented. So I think it sort of depends on what your resources are and how savvy you are as a consumer. Mm. And again, reluctant to go down this, but it all sounds horribly unfair, doesn't it? If you, if ge- geographically will influence the, the quality of the healthcare you're going to get. Well, the he- whole system, and uh, again, you can always cut this out if you have to, but the, um, the system, it, there's a tension between the cost of new developments which are astronomically high because testing in humans is very difficult ethically and it's very expensive. So when, when I get new tools in my tool chest, it usually is at the cost of about a billion dollars if I get a new treatment. Someone spent a billion dollars developing that, that medicine. So initially the access will be for the, for the rich folks. But patent laws as they are, after 17 years, then these things uh, sunset and they, the prices become affordable for the, for the broader so it's a matter of, I think, keeping the, the, the risk takers motivated. Apparently, they want to be rich, and they're willing to, to gamble. Uh, and then um, also creating a pathway for other people to en- enjoy that. But it, it's absolutely true that if you're looking at all the many of the exciting things that are uh, I'm just describing as potential, you're looking at a fairly small segment of the society that can really benefit from all this. I often ask guests on this podcast uh, to think about their own Future And we, we've talked about health span, and it's interesting to me, and I, I enjoy the fact that you, you like that expression. If we're thinking about our health span, our own personal longevity, based on what you know, and clearly you know an, an awful lot about this subject, do you live your life according to what you've learned over the decades that you've been working on this? Yes, absolutely. I, the, I'll, one way that I have and one way that I haven't. The one way that I have is the... Um, a realization that I have to exercise. And I have to find ways to make myself exercise because I find it distinctly unpleasant. So I, I try and use my competitive urges and play tennis because I'll go out and bust my butt so I don't lose. I guess that matters to me, and that forces me to exercise. And then the other way I've been motivated, I have a, a small weight machine in my bedroom, is that uh, there's really only one intervention that helps improve memory. They've tried all kinds of pills and supplements, and none of them are very convincing. But one thing that makes a big difference is exercise. And I have to use my memory every day of my life when I'm trying to recall these different patients that I'm seeing. And I can see a distinct difference between when I'm diligent in exercise and when I'm not. And of course, all the studies bear that out as well. Now, in the area that I'm less successful in implementing, we talk about diet and exercise as being two important lifestyle things, is uh, that uh, um, my wife happens to be a uh, gourmet cook. And uh, she grew up in circumstances that were um, challenged, to say the least. And uh, for the first half of her life, she ate a vegetarian diet because there was nothing else. And uh, so she likes to cook uh, delicious foods. And um, I've repeatedly asked her to, to, you know, convert us to a vegetarian type approach but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it, it didn't happen in the Shoals home but, it, uh, Interesting you say that and perhaps it explains why some of the poorer communities around the world actually have the best longevity because Yeah and it's the lowest cancer incidence. The simple living Yes, yeah 
And you mentioned your wife, and we've been talking about clearly an issue that is exclusive to men, and that is uh, prostate issues. But dealing with something like this isn't just an individual challenge, is it? You need the people around you, your, your loved ones, or even mm-hmm. your friends, if you, you share issues. It, it is a, it's a family affair, isn't it? It is, and I'm glad you. I'm going to go just a slightly different. Maybe we can come back to what you're talking about. But when I have patients uh, come in to consult with me to answer some of these complex questions, I am uh, encouraged and comforted when I see that they've br- brought one or two additional people with them. Uh, problem solving with teams is much better than with an individual, and the amount of information, just what we've talked about today, is that it's a heavy download of of stuff, and. The uh, the need to capture as much of this information and implement it is 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 very important. But uh, and if you have a helper in the process, in the decision making process, I believe people get a lot closer to the outcomes. But I think what you were pointing out was that the um, uh, if a man becomes impotent, it's not just him that suffers. I mean that that is uh, if if they're an, an enjoying an uh, ongoing good romantic relationship, that's. Um, a devastating impact on, on relationship. And it's not just the fact that sexual performance has changed, it's the man's identity, his self-image has been drastically altered. And uh, that is, uh, uh, the repercussions have never, I don't, no one's even tried to plumb the repercussions of all the several million men in the United States that had unnecessary prostate surgery over the last 25 years. You've referred to the almost bewildering advances that we have in, in this and other medical areas and how things are, are changing. I take it from what you say that you are optimistic about this field of science moving very, forward? Very optimistic. I have some children in, uh, in their mid-20s, and I tell them take good care of themselves because uh, you're all going to live to be over 100 years old. Uh, you're certainly not going to die of cancer or heart disease. Those problems will be solved in the next 20, 25 years. And so, uh, you know, prepare for a very long life because what's changed and the reason that I am so optimistic is when I began practicing, I'm 65 years old, I've been doing this for 25 years the um, all the treatments that I had back in uh, the 80s and 90s were derived by um, trial and error. We had these extracts of bark and, and you know, purified this and that that had somehow been discovered to have activity, but we didn't know how it worked. But over the last 10, 15 years, because of the billions of dollars that have been spent on basic science and research, we understand how the cancer cell works now. We understand why it's different from the normal cell. And now they can rationally design solutions just the way we do computer patches, computer fixes, uh, software patches. And that, uh, as I mentioned, is an expensive and difficult process but it's targeted to specific problems and rather than this randomness is what, you know, think of chemotherapy. That was discovered just through random searching and you have all this collateral damage with hair loss and feeling sick, whereas the modern medicines that we have now, which were designed to solve a specific cancer-related problem, many of them have fewer, no side effects, and they're three to five times more effective. So, and because they have fewer side effects, they can be used in combination. Think of what happened with AIDS. I mean, you look like you might be old enough to have remembered when every, that was a death sentence. And now Magic Johnson's still with us. That's all through the amazing um, power of modern technology ap- ap- applied to solving these problems. Yeah, absolutely right. I am old enough. But <laughs> this has been a hugely illuminating conversation. Thank you very much. And you've said a couple of times, I can cut that out if I want to. I'm, if you're happy, I'm going to leave it all in. <laughs> okay. Even the explicit bits, maybe I'll check that box. <laughs> Just to warn people that uh, we, we discuss some quite sensitive things yep. during this podcast. But uh, I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Mark Schultz. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for having me. And as a reminder, this is a podcast where we share ideas. We don't necessarily give you medical advice advice. If you'd like to talk to your own doctor, that's what we advise you to do if there's something that is concerning you. And also a reminder that if you want to listen to some of our back catalogue episodes, they're all available via our website, llamapodcast.com. That's double L-A-M-A podcast.com or through the podcast platform of your choice, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. And if you've got a chance to rate and review us, we'd be very grateful for that. It's always good to hear your thoughts. Many thanks for listening.
Health optimization is what this podcast is all about, and that means taking care of our mitochondria, the energy centres of our cells. Physical strength, avoiding frailty, is key, and that's why the science behind urolithin A and the work of Timeline Nutrition is so interesting. You can find out more and get a discount code at our website and in the show notes for this episode.